Uh, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Um, I, uh, I got to be honest with you, I was a little shocked walking into the room this morning to see so many bright, smiley faces at 7 o'clock in the morning, <clears throat> even though it's my normal time of day to come to work. Uh, listen, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some personal side, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the professional side of what we do with John and Hope for Prisoners. But first, I got to give you a little bit of background on our police department. We're not your traditional uh, city police department. We're a county-wide agency. We merged in 1973 the city of Las Vegas Police Department and the county of Clark Sheriff's Department. And in turn, the, the state kept an elected official over our, our department. But we're a metropolitan police department. We have jurisdiction over 7,700 miles of Clark County, square miles, and 42 million visitors that come to our city every single year. So when you come to Vegas and you say, hey, where do you work? It, we work for Metro. It's a Metropolitan Police Department. But because we work for a county sheriff, we also oversee the Clark County Detention Center. So we have policing on one hand, and we also have the jail on the other in a metropolitan large city. So currently, right now, I, I actually, part of my duties is I oversee the Clark County Detention Center where there's 4,000 inmates. Um, and when I first was appointed by the sheriff about five years ago, uh, he sent me to jail. And in our profession in Vegas, you either hire on as a police officer or you hire on as a corrections officer. You don't do both until you become appointed. And then the sheriff has the ability to move a, a police officer at the higher rank over the Clark County Detention Center, which is what he did to me. I knew nothing about corrections, knew nothing um, about reentry, knew nothing about what they did. Uh, you know, I was the typical Boy Scout growing up. I wanted to fight evil. All I wanted to do is be a cop growing up. I just wanted to take bad people, put them in jail, throw away the key, and, and walk away. But now I find myself, after over 30 years in law enforcement, I'm overseeing a 4,000 inmate jail that has significant budget issues, had significant problems within the four walls when it came to what we were doing to be progressive in nature and bring reentry into the community of Las Vegas. And it was squarely on my shoulders. So I did a lot of things on the inside of the jail, but I, the, the number one thing that had to occur first was that my mindset had to change. So, <laughs> at the same time, we had a sheriff who was in his second term, and they do four-year terms out there, and you have no term limit. He was in his second term, in his final term, and uh, he was probably one of the best sheriffs our county has seen in the sense of being progressive. He realized that in order for us to be successful, not only to reduce a crime rate within our community, but also to be successful with what we did in corrections environment, that we had to be not only transparent, but progressive in nature and the way that we think and the way we act. In 2010, we had an unprecedented 25 officer-involved shootings, um, and we were being eyed by the DOJ not good for any police department. And, and those of you that are in law enforcement in the room, you know that anytime DOJ starts breathing down your neck, uh, you potentially have some bigger problems than, than you care to speak about. But our sheriff stepped up to the plate and was a leader in, in the profession. And we welcomed a lot of uh, collaborative approach with the cops office and DOJ. And we, we did not get a consent decree. And we instituted 75 initiatives within our own agency to promote change and, uh, and transparency. And it went across the spectrum of, of what our department does, from training to budget to the way we dealt with use of force. But it also went across into the jail and the way that we dealt with inmates and prisoners with inside the jail. So you fast forward even more, and I get a phone call one day from John Ponder. And I knew who John was. I would met him a couple of times. Our, cross had pathed, uh, our paths had crossed a couple of times just in normal daily work functions, but I really didn't have that much of an understanding as to what he did, or more importantly, why he did it. So uh, he invited me to graduation one day, and I'm like, graduation? For what? So he explains this to me, and, and I really didn't, I'm like, okay, so my role within the department is, all right, I'm, I'll, I'll jump on board with this, I gotta figure this out. So I show up at his office one day for graduation, and I walk in his office, and I'm like, okay, so what do you want me to talk about? <laughs> and uh, he says, well, you're going to have 30 ex-felons that are re-entering into the community coming in to graduate today, and you'll have members of the public there and from various 
walks of life from the stakeholders in the community to people offering jobs. And I just want you to give some words of encouragement. So let's talk about that for a minute. Words of encouragement from a 30-year cop to 30 ex-felons who for all intents and purposes um, I didn't have a whole lot of faith in at the time. But I got out of my comfort zone a little bit and I thought, you know what, I'll give this a shot. Let's see how this goes. I said, well, John, who else is talking today? He says, oh, we have a federal judge coming in. The district attorney is going to be there and a couple other stakeholders from the, from the community. And I thought, wow. I'm like, OK. So five minutes before graduation, I walk out into this room. And I'm telling you, it's, um, it's a room almost roughly the size of this. And it's wall to wall, standing room only. And up at the front is a federal judge in a black robe. He's sitting there with the guest speakers at him. John, where do you want me to sit? And he says, well, come over here and sit right here in the front next to everybody. I'm like, OK. And I look across the room, and there's about eight or 10 of our police officers that are standing there in uniform. And I thought, wow, this is going to be pretty cool. And next thing you know, 30 people come walking in that are going to graduate that day. And I'm telling you, it's every walk of life. White, black, Hispanic, male, female, every demographic came walking into that room. So I changed my tune immediately on what I was going to talk about. John told me, he says, you know you need to talk about motivation and, and leadership. I'm like, OK, I can probably do that. I can probably ad lib my way through that. But I'll tell you the thing that, that hit home was when I got up in front of that room, there's 30 people standing there just looking at you. And I said, if, if, if I told you 30 years ago that as a police officer, I would ever stand in front of a room of 30 ex-felons and talk to them about leadership, I'd say that you were probably um, a little bit out of your mind. But here I am. And the reason why I'm going to talk to you today is because we're going to talk about choices. And we're going to talk about self-discipline. And we're going to talk about how a police department cannot continue to arrest their way out of a crime problem. Because for a couple of decades, that's all that the police have ever tried to do is just lock people up and throw away the key. So I talked a little bit about what they do moving forward, about the choices that they make in their life, the discipline they have to bring to the table for not only themselves but for their families, and the decisions that they make going forward. And you know, they're looking at you with their eyes wide open, and every time John would say uh, the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department or the police, every one of them in unison would say, our friends. <laughs> because I, I think I realized at that moment that there was a relationship that was being built between a certain demographic of our population and my demographic. And it was a pretty powerful, pretty powerful moment. So I get done talking. I spent about, I don't know, two or three minutes talking to them about leadership and, and mainly choices in life, because that's what really life is all about. And I sat down, and then at the end, the judge gets up, and he does the oath and puts on the robe and makes them stand up and swear to this oath about staying out of trouble and doing the right thing and being good stewards to their families and, and the community. And that was it. And I left. So I had about a 15-minute drive home that night from where we were at, and all I did was think about that. And I thought, how, how powerful that a profession has looked at society differently than we ever have before. There was personal change with me. So I find out later that John has graduation every month. Every 30 days, there's graduation. And you know the building he's in is, is somewhat adequate, but he's very quickly exceeding the capacity of that, <laughs> of that room. And if you've ever been to Vegas in August, it's about 115 and can get rather warm in just about any building, no matter how good the air conditioning is. So uh, 
I don't know, maybe six months ago, John calls me up one day and he says, hey, he says, what do you think about helping us find another location to bring our graduation? And I said, what do you got in mind? He says, well, do you guys have any space? I'm like, at the police department? He says, yeah. Now, we, we moved into a new headquarters building about five years ago. It's three, four, four and five story building. And, uh, and for the cops in the room that know what Comstat is, we have a massive room that we do our Comstat process in and uh, three large video screens. And I thought, there's, there's, there's no way. There's no way the sheriff's going to say, yeah, let's bring 30 ex-felons that are graduating for Hope for Prisoners to the Metropolitan Police Department headquarters once a month. Uh, we have security concerns, and we have, you know, people that have to do their job every day. They're walking around here, and, you know, we've got to make sure that, 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 that that's on par. I, so I told John, I said, you know what, let's give this a shot. I'll, I'll, I'll go to bat for this one. Let's, let's see what we can do. So I have a conversation with the sheriff one morning over breakfast, and uh, he says, yeah, give it a shot. So for the last six months, we've been holding graduation at the headquarters of our Metropolitan Police Department. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I'll talk about is, is, is what we now do for graduation. Not only do we hold that in our headquarters building, but every month last year I, I, uh, I circulated a list of guest speakers for John from within the department, and I made it all of our executive staff. So whether you were an assistant sheriff like me or a deputy chief, the captains, uh, it was primarily sheriffs and chiefs. We put up once a month, they'd volunteer, they'd go in, and they'd be a guest speaker for John's graduation. And each one of them would bring a different perspective to these graduates of what life is supposed to be about from a cop. But more importantly, they got to see that we're, I put my pants on every day just like anybody else does. Just be, I'm a, I do police work for a living. But when it comes down to the basic fiber of life, I'm no different than anybody else. This coming year, instead of our executive staff, I'm pushing it down even further, and we're dipping down into the captain rank and the lieutenant rank that will be going in and having these guest speaking appearances for graduation. And it's people that are not being mandated to do it, but people that want to do it. I don't want to mandate anybody. The one good thing that our sheriff, our past sheriff, brought to our department is that we have embraced the culture of partnership with the community, and this is just one piece of that puzzle. It happens to be with Hope for Prisoners. There's many other things that we do. Um, we've reduced our officer-involved shootings. Um, I wish it was to zero, but it's not. Uh, last year, I think we had five. Um, yeah, from 25. So there's a lot of things that we do within our, within our community to um, promote our police department and also partner with the, with the stakeholders in our community. Uh, and one of the challenges for us and me as an administrator of a police department is to embed that type of mentality, the personal change that I took, and push that down to the lowest level. Not always an easy accomplishment, especially when you are in a profession where that 21-year-old that is um, hard charging, just comes out of the police academy, would write his mother a speeding ticket if he stopped her. <laughs> right? Their thought process is not about the other things in life that we have to do as cops. You know, when I hired on um, many years ago, we didn't have to be... Uh, Counselors, mentors, sociologists, um, community activists, um, psychologists. We had to solve every single known problem to man every call we went to. Uh, we didn't have to do that when I hired on. You showed up, somebody broke the law, they went to jail, and you went on to the next call. If the car down the street, driving down the street had a broken taillight, you stopped it, you wrote them a ticket, and if you could take them to jail, you took them to jail. To today's cops, that mentality has to change because not every single person has to go to jail. Not every single person has to end up in a prison. And, and that change is what I'm hoping that our police department continues to promote. And you know, cops traditionally are very conservative, um, including me. But that mentality can change because it's just about normal basic human rights and treating people the right way. So that's just a little bit about what we do as a department.
to help John in his process. And uh, as long as John is around, Metro is going to be around to help. So thank you.